Welcome to Virtual Book Signing. I'm Daniel Weinberg, and as usual, we're here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. We appreciate your being with us today for uh, this wonderful discussion we're going to have. Uh, and you know, while we're live now, you can email in questions to us. That's the virtual part. You are virtually with us. So uh, if you want a book uh, signed still or inscribed, we can do that during this hour. We'll have, if you're watching the archive, we'll have signed copies, first editions available for you, uh, as long as they last. Uh, as well, of course, we always wanted to, we started out with virtual book signing. Uh, we do have a crowd here today. Not all of you uh, are just out there. I appreciate everyone who's come in. Uh, but uh, we started out virtual book signing so that you could watch your book signed. But we got into discussions with our authors, and they became the uh, whole uh, show, actually, and we enjoyed doing this as well. So we'll read off some of your names uh, a little later on, and uh, thank you as well for being part of us and helping us by uh, purchasing a book, because that's how the uh, publisher brings in uh, the authors for us to do this. So uh, today uh, we're honored to have Ron Chernow here with his new book. Ron lives in Brooklyn, New York. He's a prize-winning author of five books. Of these, The House of Morgan won the National Book Award. Alexander Hamilton and Titan, The Life of John D. Rockefeller Sr., each was nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award in biography. Today, we're featuring his latest book, Washington, A Life. It's 904 packed pages uh, and illustrated. The Penguin Press is the publisher, and we appreciate uh, them sending Ron to us, and it's $40. And if you're watching right now, it would be a wonderful gift for any uh, person on your gift list at this point, uh, and maybe uh, others as well. I'll tell you of others coming up very soon. Ron, uh, let's just get into it. How do you choose the subjects that you choose? And uh, how long does it normally take you to do the new research? Well, you know, I've never been interested in doing a biography simply to uh, spin a fascinating yarn. I look for people who represent some big movement, some trend in American history. And when I look back over my works, and this was not completely conscious at the beginning, it was something that I only became aware of uh, after the fact, but that I've really written about people who have created the the building blocks of the country, whether it was the financial or economic building mm -hmm. blocks, as in the case of a J.P. Morgan or John D. Rockefeller, um, or uh, in the case of an Alexander Hamilton and a George Washington people who built the, um, the basic political institutions of the country. Well, you're in an antiquarian bookshop, uh, so I need to ask you this next question. I can understand Parson Weems, yet you write that both Douglas Southall Freeman and James Flexner are now outmoded. Uh, right. So are they truly not to be read or trusted in any way at this point? No, you know, um, people always say, what is there new left to say about George Washington? And actually starting in uh, 1969 at the University of Virginia, they uh, began publishing a new edition of Washington's papers. And every year, like clockwork, another volume or two comes out. The old edition, which was the basis of the Flexner and Freeman biographies, which are wonderful, and I still urge people to read them, but they were based on the edition of Washington's papers um, that uh, had collected 17,000 documents. The new edition of Washington's papers, 60 of projected 90 volumes have been published, is based on a collection of 135,000 documents. I always tell people we have so much information now about George Washington uh, we probably know more about George than Martha did. You feel like you could almost follow him around, not just on a daily, but almost an hourly basis. It's quite, uh, it's, it's quite phenomenal. So I think Freeman and Flexner would gladly have had the resources available now. And I actually felt that, that um, nobody had tried to do this kind of big authoritative, you know, cradle-to-grave biography of um, uh, Washington in recent uh, decades, just because the sheer amount of material had become daunting. In fact, when I started um, working on the book in, in 2004, um, people said, well, there's so many books on Washington. But what I noticed was that the books were coming out um, more frequently, but they were less ambitious. So that David McCullough did a wonderful book on a year, 1776. 
David Hackett Fisher did a wonderful book on an event, Washington's Crossing. Joe Ellis did a biography. It was, but it was kind of a thematic biography, if I could put it that way. But nobody had um, done the, the the big go for broke, cradle to grave, <laughs> pack it all between two covers kind of book in about uh, 50 years. Yeah, and one volume, and I think this is it. This is the one, is one volume that people should be reading at this point. I yeah, and, and if people are daunted by the length, I understand that. But, you know, I really felt that I was competing against uh, Douglas Southwell Freeman, seven volumes, 4,000 pages, James T. Flexner, four volumes, 2,000 pages. So the fact that I managed to limit it to only 904 pages, I feel like I was writing this story on the back of a postage stamp. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, here in the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, the same thing has happened to our man. Uh, right. been parsed down to right. every single level he can, so it's happening, it seems, with Washington as well. But every once in a while, with Lincoln, a major work comes out that reassesses no. or gives a different feel, and that's what this one is. Absolutely. Um, now, I'm showing here uh, the history of the centennial of the inauguration of uh, mm -hmm. Washington, this gigantic book that came out. Uh, and in it are innumerable portraits of not only Washington, everyone that they knew there, but yeah. others as well of Hamilton and Adams and Jefferson, etc. Uh, now, here, here is a centennial, and they are honoring him with this gigantic book, which may have had limited sales. I've only seen three or four in 39 years, but why does Washington seem such a remote figure? Uh, the first marble man is uh, Robert... Uh, uh, Robert E. Lee was called as well. And why so seemingly more so than other founders? Why is he so remote to us? Well, um, you know, Washington uh, was a very uh, reserved and subtle figure and hence difficult to capture on, on, on paper. And one of the reasons that I wrote the book is that somehow the image of Washington that has taken a residence in the American imag imagination is of a worthy man but somehow bland and boring. And I have to tell, talk about how I got involved in the, in, in the book, um, because there was a moment, um, I could date the precise moment when I started thinking about doing a Washington biography. It was about 10 years ago. I was doing the biography of Alexander Hamilton, and Hamilton, late in the Revolutionary War, had a quarrel with Washington that led to Hamilton quitting as Washington's aide-de-camp. And Hamilton, um, with a touch of youthful bravado, sat down and wrote a letter to his father-in-law defending this decision uh, to quit Washington's staff. And he wrote, the great man and I have come to an open rupture. He shall for once at least repent his ill humor. And I can remember sitting there absolutely stunned. Ill humor, the saintly father <laughs> of our country. And here Hamilton was describing Washington as a boss, as very moody and irritable and temperamental, and even something of a powder keg boss. And I think that um, it got me wondering who Washington was, but I think that because Washington was the father of the country, there was always uh, a tendency to kind of sanitize the portrait, to smooth down the, the rough edges. And unfortunately, doing that does a disservice because it turns him into a very kind of bland and mechanical uh, figure. But that figure, that very kind of wooden character that exists in so many people's minds, you know, that character could never have defeated the British Empire, which was the mightiest, mightiest military machine of the 18th century, could never have presided over the Constitutional Convention, and could never have forged the office of the presidency. Obviously, the person who did that was a force of nature. And, and as I got into this book, it turned out that, um, you know, Hamilton's word portrait, while you know, far from the whole truth about Washington. So this is not a debunking uh, book at all. But it turned out that under this immense cloak of reserve, that very stoic facade uh, that we all know, that very laconic facade, was a man who was very passionate and complex and sensitive, someone of many moods, of, you know, strong and fiery opinions, a real force of nature. And everyone who knew him felt that way, but somehow that had gotten lost in translation to posterity. And so I thought that if I could recreate that sense of excitement and even kind of charisma that Washington generated, I mean, when Washington walked into the room, everyone felt the power of his presence. In fact, if you could hand me a copy of the book, I just want to show for the any people who haven't seen you know, the cover that, yes, um, I put on, that I put on the cover, this is a painting from 1825 by Rembrandt Peel, 
beautiful picture called Washington Before Yorktown. The reason that I put this on the cover of the book is that Washington was a man with a great sense of showmanship, and uh, very often between towns, he, car he traveled by carriage or coach, which was the mundane form of travel at the time. But then on the outskirts of town, <laughs> he would always disembark from the coach, and uh, he always brought along a white parade horse, and he would mount a white parade horse with this great kind of touch of uh, showmanship, and he would ride into town on, on the white horse because people wanted to see General George Washington on horseback. He was, according to Jefferson, the greatest horseman of the age, but gives some sense of just uh, the excitement that the man generated. Yet that's not what he looked like in 1781. Uh, Despite <laughs> the inaccuracy, yeah. that is the one that uh, you're using and others love to see. What does that tell us about what we wish to remember? Well, Rembrandt, Rembrandt Peale had first painted George Washington during Washington's second term when young Rembrandt Peale was only in his uh, teens. And so uh, it's as if he put you know, the face of President Washington onto the body of General Washington because you see the kind of, you know, you see the grace of the man, and he was very graceful. You know, and unfortunately what happened, the iconic images of Washington for posterity became the Gilbert Stuart, and they were great paintings. I don't mean to detract from them at all, but they had an unfortunate effect because Gilbert Stuart um, painted Washington during Washington's second term when he had aged tremendously, when his skin uh, looked like a, a parchment when he was very uh, stiff and wouldn't look rather craggy and forbidding. But when you see pictures of Washington from the Revolutionary War uh, era, and particularly when people would describe him, this was the greatest horseman of the age. This was a famous dancer. This was someone who carried himself in this rather majestic way. He was a prodigious athlete. He didn't throw a silver dollar. Across the, uh, you know, the behind the, us uh, right. is this John Rogers 1875 statue, and that one is uh, one that really shows him. This is done in 1875, yeah. and uh, what can you tell us of his frame and stature and features? Uh, give us a brief overview of what he was. Well, he was a man of prodigious uh, uh, strength, and 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 all the previous biographies had said that he was six foot two, six foot three, six foot three and a half. And just to give you some sense of how one goes about creating a fresh portrait of a, a, a character. When I looked at it, because uh, six foot three and a half would indeed be, be tall now, it would be gigantic by the 18th century. Uh, and I knew that he had unusually large hands and feet and very kind of muscular uh, frame, but I was, I was dubious about the six foot three and a half. And it turned out that it all rested on a single piece of evidence, that piece of evidence being that when uh, Washington was measured for his casket, he measured exactly six foot three and a half, which would seem to be conclusive proof, right? Wrong, okay. Here's an experiment for you all to do. When you go home tonight, <laughs> lie down in bed on your back and just relax. What you'll see is that in the state of relaxation, the feet fall forward, the toes point out, or it, and it adds approximately six and a half, three and a half uh, inches to your height. Because when we measure people, we measure people standing, um, and the leg is perpendicular to the uh, to, to the foot, so that Washington's toes must have been pointing outward in rigor mortis uh, uh, set in. I actually collected, I got very interested in this uh, subject. See, biographers are, 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 all, are all obsessives. Uh, I got very interested in the question of Washington's height, and so I actually collected 40 different uh, references in contemporary letters and diaries to Washington's height. And I, and I would say that in about 35 of the 40, he was described as a man of, of uh, six feet tall. But then, Daniel, came the clincher. Before the Revolutionary War, Washington, like all the Virginia planters, ordered his clothing uh, every six months from a tailor in London. And people in the 18th century became very skillful at describing their, their body because they were ordering, as it were, by mail order catalog. Um, and every six months, Washington wrote to his tailor in London that he was a man exactly six feet tall. And we all know there's one person in the world, except for your mother, that you can't lie to about your height, and that's your London tailor, unless you want to end up looking quite ridiculous. So I think that I can say 
with great authority after two centuries of studying of Washington that he definitely was only six feet tall. <laughs>